dear friends, in German we would so there's sort of the, the gender appropriate both forms, but um, in this case tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we can almost not say because mostly women came tonight, which is unusual for our auditorium. We have usually more of an equal female and male turnout. Listen, I'm very happy that so many of you came tonight, um, although the weather is nice and a lot of people I thought would maybe prefer to go to the Danube for a little swim, the first one of this season. And still you all came, so uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you, Gertraud, for hosting us here at Kreisky Forum. And a very special thank you to you, Kathleen. Thank you for coming all the way from uh, England to Austria. And welcome to Kreisky Forum. Thank you. Thank you. When I met uh, Kathleen the first time last fall in London, um, she was just after quite a tricky period. You, l you sort of left your position as professor for philosophy at the University of Sussex in England uh, after quite a difficult debate that also became very personal. Um, and uh, after you spent a few years in a very heated debate about uh, feminist and transgender issues, that um, I'm very happy that we can debate them tonight here too, mm -hmm. because I think it's actually very important to talk about these issues. And without... Um, uh, being afraid also to, to speak about the differences uh, that there are. And as you taught for 18 years, I think, mm -hmm. at the University of Sussex, you were as a, you know, philosophy is a, is a subject where people are used to different opinions and testing different grounds. And um, so I, uh, I hope that we can go through a few of these questions tonight also. We should mention your book that came out in 2019 in England? No, 2020. 20 think, yeah. in English has just been published also in German. We have it here. And you can also, yeah, I'm just checking, <laughs> Kathleen. They misspelled your name here. That's yes, not good, but it's only the first edition <laughs> where Kathleen is a little bit in a different way. But uh, we have a few of those books also outside on the book, um, in the book uh, store. And um, you can purchase the book and also have it signed by Kathleen. I think you'll be happy to yeah. do that afterwards. Yeah. OK. And this book is sort of the foundation of uh, the whole debate that also got, got you into, so shall I say, it's like hot water, we would mm -hmm. say in German, in this whole uh, ideological um, uh, heated space that uh, transgender and feminist issues at the moment uh, have to get through, I would think. You know, I'm always uh, somewhat troubled by the fact that uh, a part of a political debate that I consider to be progressive is now tearing each other apart. You know, I would always wish that feminists and transgender people can um, find a common ground to stand on. And if that doesn't happen, then we should find out why and how. So in order to start maybe to get, because I'm not quite sure how much people here have followed what happened also to you in the last half a year. So maybe if you can fill us in a little bit how your problems started when you, how you got engaged in this whole trans, as a feminist in this transgender yeah. debate. Okay, well, um, about, so in 2018, um, there was a public consultation in Britain about this concept called self ID. Um, and it was an idea that had been pushed through by trans activist organizations. And when I say trans activist organizations, I always make this distinction because I don't think they actually represent 
trans people very well, and quite a lot of people who are in trans activist organisations are not trans. So I just want to make that clear that this is not feminists versus trans people. It's um, some feminists against some trans activists. But um, anyway, trans activists have been pushing this line that sex, legal sex changes, which we already have in the UK, you can get a legal sex change um, if you fulfill certain conditions. And the idea was we should drop the conditions and anyone should be able to legally change their sex basically by filling in a form. And of course that would give you access potentially um, to a range of resources and spaces and uh, sporting teams and all sorts of things. Um, so it seemed like there were some potentially big problems there, um, particularly with respect to males self-identifying as women and getting legal uh, sex change. So there was this public consultation and I hadn't said anything about it until then because it wasn't my area of expertise particularly, but I was a feminist and I was quite concerned. And what I noticed was that nobody in British universities, pretty much, was um, saying anything critical about this idea at all. There was lots of people saying it's a brilliant idea, um, very loudly, and lots of students thought it was brilliant, and lots of gender studies professors thought it was brilliant. But um, I thought it was weird <laughs> that there was this total silence <laughs> on the other side. So I wrote a blog post, uh, like self-published a piece uh, on medium um, and that's when my troubles began <laughs> as you can see so uh, immediately there was a pushback which I knew there would be because the other thing that had been happening during that period of public consultation was that grassroots left-wing um, organizations in particular uh, run by women um, we're starting to try and hold meetings in cities or towns in the UK to get people to talk about this, and they were um, receiving violent protests, bomb threats, and all sorts of really hostile, intolerant behavior. So I knew there was gonna be a few issues there. And then from then on, it just sort of kept ratcheting up because I then was invited to speak at one of these meetings. It was a big protest. Um, and then I gave a few interviews and there were even more protests, and then it started to become this sort of uh, feeling, well, feeling like you're in a battle, really. Be um, yeah, so there's lots more I could say, but that's the basic how it started. But it sort of, that was, so it took sort of three years until it became so heated that it became also uh, uh, known as a debate to the mainstream media sort of yeah. yeah I mean it always takes a while until a subject a topic becomes really yeah. a, a question of being in the news so to speak and it was last summer I would say when it really it was it when was your when name we, became also yeah. connected with and that must have been probably um, given you a prominence that you were probably not so keen on to be <laughs> I mean it, it so there was sort of for that, for, throughout that three years, it wasn't easy. I mean, there were, um, I would be, you know, there was lots of open letters and petitions and um, there was protests on my campus in 2018. Um, people always trying to get me fired or complain to my managers or look at my tweets and kind of hold them up as, because in this, in this area, any kind of critical discussion of this gets called transphobic immediately you can't you know there's just so much you cannot say um, your words are constantly monitored you cannot say trans women are male you cannot say that they are male bodied you cannot say that people cannot change sex you can't say any of that without immediately getting this you're transphobic you're bigoted you shouldn't be allowed to say this so um, I was in a kind of uh, quite entrenched position um, and quite tired of it really um, but in October last year, when I went back to campus after COVID had kept us all off campus for a long time, there'd been, over the summer, there'd been this decision on behalf of, who knows, I don't even know, some students, if they were students, I don't know, um, some of them were, to mount an organized campaign against me. So they made posters, they made stickers, and they started to plan what they were gonna do. So when I got back to campus, that's when I started seeing my name <laughs> on posters saying quit, fire her, she's transphobic, we don't pay our fees, 
to be taught by this person. And then they started coming to campus and setting off flares. And, you know, it got sort of over a period of about two or three weeks, it just seemed to get more and more intense. So that's when it, that's when the newspapers really started to pay attention. Mm. But <clears throat> you then decided to quit your position, although the university management had mm. at least nominally stood behind you. But you didn't feel yeah. they were really... Well, they, as I say, you. this had been going on for three years, right? So they did... Uh, uh, when masked men started coming to campus, <laughs> holding up banners saying, fire Kathleen Stock, they felt they had to say something. But there were plenty of times when I could have been more supported earlier. I mean, I was very much isolated, and I really treated like a massive embarrassment because they thought that I was stopping... Um, this is in Brighton, so Brighton is the queer LGBT centre of, of, of the UK, and they, my university, as was, market themselves to young LGBTQ plus students, so they thought I was a massive embarrassment, I think. So yes, eventually they, through gritted teeth, started to support me, but at the same time, I was under constant attack from, co um, not in philosophy, but in other departments from colleagues. There was just a steady stream of, of professors going onto the internet saying that I, I harmed students, I made them unsafe, um, I was a bigot, I was an idiot, <laughs> I hadn't read all the sacred texts that I was supposed to have read, and I didn't, you know, I didn't ag agree with them. Obviously, I had read them. Um, they're not very good. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it was more the lack of support from the institution, not just managers, but, you know, like some kind of solidarity. People don't have to agree with me, but when they're, when they're actually denouncing you, it becomes, for me, it just was, became intolerable, really. But is that sort of uh, also part of this, you know, at British universities, uh, people are often very careful of what they say about certain subjects, not only transgender or feminist issues now. But is that, would you say there's a climate of fear or is that something that only some people feel? Because I've spoken to some university professors who say that they have no problem. <laughs> yeah. Of course they do. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, there's no problem if you have the right opinions. <laughs> there's absolutely no problem if you have the right opinions. But as we know, that can change. Yeah, so I mean, quickly. if you are most uh, UK academics are on the left, as I am in some sense on the left, uh, although I disagree with a lot of the uh, progressive stuff these days. But, um, you know, so if you stay in your lane and stick to the... I mean, for a start, most of them aren't doing anything political. So... Uh, um, a geography professor is not going to get cancelled most of the time. But if you go move into p political territory and start deviating, so for instance, if, if you're pro-Brexit, um, people found it really difficult within academia to um, articulate a case for Brexit because vice chancellors would be saying, you know, this is a terrible decision and we've made a terrible mistake. So their, their managers would be saying this is... Um, this is a bad decision, and obviously it, it does somewhat constrain you if your managers are telling you that your views are really unacceptable. And in this case, um, and maybe this is a kind of object lesson of how not to do things for everyone else, but um, our institutions nationally have been um, infiltrated, really, by this organisation called Stonewall, who's got this enormously powerful uh, reputation based on its work in gay rights. And they have... Um, this whole scheme where you can, they work through HR departments to make institutions what they call diversity champions. So you get, and you enter into this kind of elaborate prize system where you can get up the index. They have an index of um, LGBT friendly employers, and it's a real big game to get right up the index. Everyone's very proud of it. And Stonewall for years have been pushing self ID through and saying to universities, you should make all of your spaces self-ID anyway. Like, you should just say, you should have policies saying any male that feels like they're a woman can go into that changing room or that hall of residence or that rape crisis shelter or prison or whatever it is. <laughs> um, so institutions were captured. They just didn't have, they believed it. They, did, they, thought, they thought about it in very one-dimensional ways. And when it came to women speaking up, they just automatically thought these people must be bigoted. There's no other reason why they would be saying this. 
because they just hadn't thought it through. And they had all these policies saying you mustn't, basically you mustn't discuss this, because if you discuss this freely, you're going to harm trans people. Well, I mean, to, to put it a little bit into context, because Stonewall, I don't think in Austria there is an equivalent of that uh, type of lobby group that became quite influential. You know, they, they worked also with the BBC mm -hmm. and the universities, different institutions. And in principle, when it is, it is a very, you know, they really wanted to help uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, members, people, to be re better represented and less discriminated against in, in those institutions. So the BBC, uh, f 40 years ago, uh, started to hire more women. And then when there were more women, and then, you know, the, the things changed, the society changed. So then it became more important uh, uh, than have only white men on as directors to have also people of color. And then, you know, the, the people who are maybe not uh, men or women, but maybe intersex or, or trans or whatever else, yeah? Or non-binary well, or whatever. I mean, so in yeah. principle, <laughs> the idea wasn't bad the idea to have wasn't Stonewall. bad, of course, um, but we already had, um, from 2010 onwards in Britain, we have a very good law, well actually, there's some problems with it, but in principle it's a good law called the Equality Act, which protects sex, as in biological sex, uh, male or female, and also protects uh, gender reassignment. So we have existing laws to protect trans people from discrimination, from, especially at work, you can't fire someone because they're trans, you're not, you can't um, harass someone because they're trans, and it's built into UK law already. So um, it's not as if they were saying, look, there's no laws protecting trans people, we have to find some. There's a cynical explanation of what happened, which is that Stonewall managed to very happily for me uh, get gay marriage on the books they managed to get gay adoption on the books and they didn't have anything else to do <laughs> and then in 2015 they had this whole new document it was called a vision for change and they sent it out through every institution and the idea was you should anyone should be able to self-identify into whatever category they want to with no pretty much no exceptions no real exceptions um, and they push that through as this noble thing, and I'm not sure that is a noble thing. I mean, I just don't even know why that would even fall under the um, auspices of trans rights. It's a very radical policy, um, which clearly has implications for the rest of us. You know, so that's that's a slightly more cynical take on <laughs> yeah. Their but I mean, to put it very simple, so what is wrong with self ID? Okay, well, sorry, but I mean, you know, to just to so go to the So self-ID as an umbrella concept these days includes not just legal sef sex change, but also any kind of policy which previously would have said, this, this is for women only. Self-ID as a kind of umbrella policy would say, it's not for women understood as sex, female, it's for women understood as anyone who feels like a female. So that's obviously a big... Um, leap away from even the stereotypical idea of a transsexual because it does not require surgery, it does not require hormones, it doesn't even require dressing, putting a dress on or anything. It just requires having a feeling which you state sincerely or not <laughs> and nobody can tell you that you're wrong because it's your feeling. No, I can't look inside anyone's head, nobody can and say, no, you don't have the right feeling. So really it just allows any male of any under any circumstances to enter these women's spaces and resources. Now that has seemed to many, including me, to severely underplay the potential for the ways in which this can go wrong, given what we know of the male sex and its relation <laughs> to the female sex. <laughs> um, and so I think at the very least we need to discuss if that's the policy, you know, how do we protect women who are getting undressed or sleeping or otherwise vulnerable to sexual assault? How do we protect those women or how do we protect children? Or, um, and then there's a sports issue which is blowing up at the moment. You know, how do we ensure fairness when bodies that have been through testosterone at puberty um, and have a massive advantage that really can't be taken away even if you do take estrogen? 
how do we sort that out? Um, so there's a huge range of questions, and I would say it's a terrible policy because <laughs> it doesn't take into account the multiple sufferings, the ways in which women may suffer as a result of this policy, basically. We still need a um, solution, though, for people who are non-binary, people who are transgender, and who maybe haven't, uh, I don't know, com completely finished their, their sex change, and they still need to go to the bathroom somewhere. So either well, this or that. So, okay. we, the, uh, you know, the easiest solution, which I always, which is also spreading that bathrooms become self-ID and you have one for men, one for women, and the third one for everyone who yeah. doesn't want to identify as one of those. Mm -hmm. But that, of course, is not always possible. But isn't there a lot of this really sort of practical solutions can be found and it, we don't have to fight for this for the next 200 years? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I agree that we need to find practical solutions that take into account the interests of everybody. I would slightly push back on the fact, I'm sorry, I mean, this is where we may disagree, that non-binary people need special <laughs> bathrooms. Um, I don't really understand that because that partly because I just think, you know, being non-binary so the original context, let's just go back to why it was originally important to, have to, to let transsexual women into women's bathrooms. The argument was they will face violence in male bathrooms. That was the, supposed to be the big hook. You know, they can't go into the male bathrooms because, so they, they must go into the women's. You That's can't, a valid argument, isn't it? Well, maybe, but then I'm just pointing out that does not apply to non-binary people. Nobody knows you can't tell from looking at someone if they're non-binary. There's no da extra danger in going in a bathroom. You know, it's just not the whole conversation has shifted to these inner states as opposed to these outer facts. That argument, I think, is valid, the one about um, valid. I mean, it's, it's a reasonable concern, but it has to be balanced against the equally reasonable concern that it's not women's responsibility necessary to sort that one out, given that they're not the ones aggressing <laughs> the trans women in, in the original bathroom. So third spaces seem to me a very good um, compromise in that case. And, you know, these organizations that I'm talking about, like Stonewall, for instance, they are very well resourced. They get millions of pounds, partly from the government. Um, they could have put all their energy into that campaign, but they didn't. And so that's the question. Why didn't they? And I think it's partly because they treat gender identity as this kind of fundamental, integral part of who you are that just has to be somehow recognized by everybody or else it's a, an affront to your human rights. And that I do not agree with at all. But it's, the question is, of course, that uh, if uh, someone feels like a woman, and I say feel on purpose now, <laughs> because, you know, uh, let's say there's no, there is not, there, there wasn't a sex operation, there was not a kind of, you know, a hormonal treatment, but somebody feels like a woman and likes to go out to the female bathroom. I mean, I personally would say like, okay, I think I, I wouldn't kick people out of this bathroom and say like, you have to go somewhere else because uh, you, have, you, you are not biologically a woman. I mean, I find it a little bit narrow-minded, but is that because I'm a privileged white woman who hasn't been sexually harassed by men. Well, I do think it is, I wouldn't want to say that, but um, I do think it's telling that this, this demand is coming from bourgeois people <laughs> and it's impacting socioeconomically vulnerable people the most. So actually where it's clearly, to me, the mo one of the most obvious injustices is in the prison system um, where males who haven't had surgery or hormones, and in some cases not even a legal sex change, are self-identifying into women's prisons. And, that's, and some of them are sex offenders against women, and they are placed in women's prisons. Now that, so yeah, those are the women who are suffering as a result of these policies. And you know, as far as bathrooms go, I think it depends on the bathroom. Sometimes in Britain, the bathrooms are really quite flimsy, you, you know, you haven't got a separate closed cubicle. There's many reports, because now in Britain, the other thing that's happening, institutions clearly don't know what to do with all this, so they're just making all of it uh, unisex. So you can go in with your daughter or your son 
and there'll be a man just pissing in a urinal, you know, <laughs> and it's a surprise, it's a shock, it's not what we expected, and I don't necessarily see why we're doing it. So, yes, it's not the main problem here, but it's indicative of the lack of care for women who don't want this, and men who don't want it, to be honest, either. I think quite a lot of men want their own <laughs> bathrooms as well. Yeah, but, in, you know, in principle, this whole bathroom, we shouldn't talk maybe endlessly about <laughs> It's not the main issue. Because it's also not the main issue. And, and I just have the feeling also this is a transitional stage where probably we'll end up much more having closed bathrooms, you know, not this kind of urinal thingies, and so that it will be t really unisex. And if you go into your own yeah. cubicle or whatever, you close the door, that's it. If you're a man or a woman, you do your thing and you leave, and you don't have too much of a sort of... Uh, you know, public space right. debate even about if you're washing your hands there's next to a man or to a woman, it really doesn't also there's matter. There's changing anything. rooms. There's halls of residence. There's uh, domestic violence refuges. There's rape crisis shelters. There's a whole yeah. range of spaces yes. which are pro more important yeah. than bathrooms, um, which m most of us, well, many of us may not use. We use, all of us use bathrooms all the time and that's why it ends up talking about that. But there's a range of spaces where it's going to be impossible to satisfy the demand that males can just enter there because they feel like it, Yeah, I think. And that is a, is a real also valid problem if you look at prisons, for example, because people who, um, I, I think both uh, options, uh, if you get it wrong, are very, very unfortunate. So you don't want to have, like you said, there's one famous case also in Britain. What was Which her one? name, his name, her name, Karen White? Oh. There's Karen yeah. White. So um, a, 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 a transgender woman who still had uh, had it got a, a legal sex change was a male, and attacked, legally a male. Attacked, I mean, yeah, in yeah, no yeah, sense yeah. a woman. Inmates <laughs> after she, she or he was put into into a female prison, and that of course should not happen. And there needs to be a solution for a case like this. On the other hand, there are also cases of uh, transgender <coughs> men sort of formerly women who have been put in male prisons uh, and have then, because it was, you know, they didn't completely fulfill the social norm of looking like a man, were then attacked and sexually harassed by male inmates. So that, of course, should also not happen. I mean, we have to somehow find a way to protect yeah. uh, prisoners who, you know, if they are, uh, you know, uh, going into female prisons, because they want to attack uh, f female inmates because they're they're perverts, then that is a problem that has to be dealt with the law. In principle, we need a solution for well, the fact that people... We have got one in the UK, or at least it's an attempt, <laughs> attempt at one, which is that there is now a um, dedicated prison wing um, for trans exactly. women. So yeah. that's a sort of third space yeah. option again. Um, and I, again, I don't see... Why, why men, I don't see why men are still being put in women's prisons when there is that option available. I don't see it. And that's going on in the UK, but it's also happening in Ireland, it's happening in Canada, it's happening in California, it's happening in Australia. Um, so it's not just in the UK. This, so it really speaks to the heart of this idea of self-ID. It seems to mystify people. They become sort of um, optimists about human nature all of a sudden. You know, like, why would any male want to go to all the trouble of saying they're a woman in order to get into a woman's prison? Well, <laughs> lots of reasons. <laughs> For a start, women's prisons are much nicer places than men's <laughs> prisons. Um, and uh, then there's all the extra contact that you will have with women in every stage of their daily life, including showers, gyms, <laughs> changing rooms, you know. I've talked to prison governors about it, and it's full contact. Mm. So there's lots of reasons why males would want to take advantage of this. Well, it's also difficult enough to be in prison. Um, and But all these things are things where we can, in my view, can find uh, practical solutions again. Mm -hmm. But we have to also recognize that the society is changing. I mean, it's not by denying the fact that people are um, the numbers are now really 
growing and growing fast mm -hmm. of people who do not uh, identify with the sex that they have been assigned with at birth. As I think that's the phrase at the moment, you know. It's not one I would use, but Okay, yeah. so which one would I you would use? I would say they Born don't identify with the, with the sex they sex. have. Okay, but I mean, some people are born as a girl and they, and they are also written with, uh, but they don't feel that yeah, woman. So we that. have to recognize that that's a thing. Well, we have to, t we have to be very sensitive about it, right? So of course I recognize that because another um, big focus of my concern is the number of females and particularly adolescent girls who are identifying out of their sex. I mean, they are, they're not changing sex, but they don't want to be girls anymore or women. Um, they want to be non-binary or, or male. Um, so we need to ask why. But it would be very stupid of us to take that as a kind of um, brute datum, like, oh, it's happening. Oh, well, we'd better like accommodate it. We need to find out why it's happening. And quite often, there's a kind of feedback loop. The more that we talk about it, the more girls hear about it, the more they start thinking it's an option. And there's a long history, as I'm sure everyone knows, of girls, adolescent girls, uh, finding new ways to express <coughs> distress culturally. So. When I used to teach at Sussex like 10 years ago, quite a lot of the girls would have cuts all over their arms. I, don't see, I didn't see that so much recently, but I would see breast binding. I would see the desire to get rid of your breasts or have mastectomies. Mm -hmm. So there's a, the, the problem with this idea that trans is just one thing is it doesn't really help us actually look at sex differences between trans populations. And then even within male populations, there's differences. There's gay men, mm -hmm. there's people with a fetish. You know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons why you might be trans. So, um, yes, it is definitely a thing at the moment <laughs> that we need to pay attention to. But I don't think that means we automatically say, okay, you can, all, you can get whatever this organization speaking on your behalf says you need. Because the organizations that speak on their behalf are not very Yeah, but it uh, is, I mean, good. <laughs> it, I, I find it actually quite... Um, beautiful that it's possible now for people to discuss these things uh, because obviously uh, there are not only men and women and not everyone is happy with the way they are being born, raised and educated. And, and the interesting thing that I find, it, you know, it really affects so many of us, the debate, we are all discussing it, even if, you know, I, for example, I'm quite happy with the the, um, that I'm born a woman and I stayed a woman. But we are all affected, of course, by the debates, what is a woman and what is a man and how this uh, over-feminist theory mm -hmm. evolved also. So you discuss this broadly in, in your book and it's, it's very, very interesting. I, I read it now again in the German uh, edition, how, you know, we were, m my generation, you know, so, intrigued by Simone de Beauvoir. And it was also, this was revolutionary to break up uh, the idea that as a woman you had to behave, you know, this is a biological thing, but it came with a set of society um, requests to you how to behave. And what she did for us was to say, there's a social construct. Gender is a social construct, and then there is a biological sex. And this is sort of how she sort of taught us to say, like, you don't have to, lo to live like what mm -hmm. your grandmother and your mother still told you what a woman uh, had to do and was supposed to do in the kitchen or in the things and the this and the that. And that was great. So, but now we are, have evolved of this. So it's not, it's, it has... We've regressed. <laughs> well, you say we have regressed, but in a way it's also quite interesting to discuss, to to uh, not be fixed on the fact that the biological sex has to restrain you. Okay. Because it doesn't no, no, have no, no, to. No. <laughs> I have a million objections to that. Good. Go on, uh, come out with them. I mean, there's nothing wrong with... <laughs> um, there's nothing wrong with de Beauvoir's stance. Uh, obviously not. Um, you can argue about which is the contribution of biology and which is the construct, uh, the bit of the construct bit, but there's obviously a lot about femininity and about expectations upon women and men that um, differ culturally and are harmful, and that's fine.
But then when you start saying, ah, um, no, what's really a social construct is womanhood and manhood itself, maleness and femaleness, biology, all of it, you know, it's all the construct all of a sudden, then you lose track of, um, of, well, what seems to have been obscured in all that is, is that when, people, when a man says, I feel like a woman, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean? And usually what it means is, I like lipstick, I like glittery things, I like playing with dolls, um, I would like to be victimized, I would like to be harassed sexually. There's like quite a lot of trans women going in press saying that they are envious of women being harassed sexually and that they want to be harassed sexually too. So in other words, these gross sexist stereotypes are being built into what womanhood is according to this new theory and that's going backwards not forwards so and the other thing just to argue with you further <laughs> is um you know I think there's something very hubristic about kind of late stage liberalism to put it facetiously that makes us think we could be free from biology like biology isn't a constraint that we can break it's our nature like we're animals <laughs> we're in the natural world we're located in the natural world and I think this idea that we can just break free of biology or deny biology it's a bit like climate change denial it's just a sort of attempt to kind of avoid our mortal finite animal natures basically so no <laughs> sorry <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 this is, that's why you're here. This is good, this is good, that's what we want. What I feel in this debate, uh, what um, is important to me is, you, you will have biological facts, of course, yeah? Mm -hmm. But you, I, again, I don't think you have to be necessarily as restrained by them as we were, because there's a lot of things that happened also with, um, getting children, for example, yeah? So it's the, 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 the old ways where you had needed a man and a woman and they had to sleep together in order to have children. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case anymore. So that changes our mm -hmm. view of, um, of what a woman or a man is, what they are, what, they, what their functions are. And it is a big societal change that comes with it. That's one thing. But deeper than this is, of course, the question how, uh, how many people in fact really are not identifying as a man or a woman or the other way around or something. Well, we in don't between. know. I mean, in Britain, we don't really know, which is another aspect which is quite infuriating because these huge arguments are happening with a, very, with a lack of data. Um, we could know because in theory, we, or we had an opportunity to know because we just had a census um, which could have asked us about our biological sex and then could have asked us about our gender identity and our legal sex and could have and then you could have disaggregated all that. But um, Stonewall and other organizations pressured the census makers into making the sex question a self-ID question. So um, then, they, then they were challenged in the court and they wrote back to saying, well, it can be legal sex, but still that won't get exactly the data we're looking for. So this is the problem. Another problem with self-ID is that it's gone into information gathering. So now the idea is instead of knowing about, um, say, the sex pay gap, um, we are finding out about the gender identity pay gap or something like that. So, um, which isn't, the gender identity pay is not causally contributing to the pay gap. It's to do with maternity and reproduction or the likelihood of it. So um, we're losing all this data about women, and particularly at the level of younger women, because more of them are saying, I'm non-binary, I'm not a woman, da da da. So um, that's a bit of a tragedy, I think, for them. Um, and also just kind of underlines how ridiculous this whole dispute is, because we don't even know how many people we're arguing about. Although yeah. we do know that women are half the population. Yes, and it, I mean, it is really also, uh, will be very interesting. Um, I hope we can discuss it in 20 years and then when we can see <laughs> no. if that sort of has that. <laughs> but you don't I'm have not, to exclusively do that. I'm you don't have to it. do that. It's just, we can discuss it or we can sort of see what the results yeah. of this, you know, how this develops. Yeah? yeah, If in 20 years people have completely moved on from this and found their peace with the fact that... Um, 
you know, the exclusivity of, uh, of uh, gender spaces uh, uh, has been overruled by unisex spaces or something like this. I mean, this is entirely possible. It's possible, but I mean, I do want to emphasize that um, another bit of data that seems to be overlooked. So as I said, the, the whole impetus for the spaces argument, it, originally anyway, was trans women are unsafe. Right, and that is something you will hear in arguments about this constantly, not just in the UK, but in America in particular. You know, trans women are the most vulnerable population there is, it, you will hear. But if you look at data <laughs> that we have about murder rates, you know, it's, it's, nobody wants to see high ones. I do not want to see high ones, but um, they're low. And in Europe, they're very low, okay? And if you look at hate crime data, convictions for hate crimes against uh, gender identity in the UK are much lower, although of course we don't know the population, so it's a bit difficult, um, but much lower than racist hate crimes. So in fact, this whole idea that there's this terrifying threat that we have to mitigate by restructuring our whole social order is not established as far as I'm concerned. Well, in that argument, um, I always feel there's a little bit this and it, 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 it makes me feel uncomfortable that we as women have to now defend the spaces that sort of feminism also fought for mm -hmm. to say that we are not letting in basically the transgender population, mm -hmm. transgender women, to, to because we, we feel threatened by it. And I would, as a, as a woman, like to say we can take these sort of new guys in because they still have to establish themselves. Yeah? Tessa. Yeah, really, seriously. I think it's important to, to be open well, I'm in that sense that. to say like, you know, they don't have a space yet in society. People look at them and say like, uh, no. you are, you're not this, you're not that, you look funny, you're nothing. It's not as, about looking as much funny. As people, well, it's people not about said that funny. about, it's about, about gay people uh, 50 years ago. People had to you know, were okay. awkward about it. And now we, we crossed that um, in society, more or less in ours at least, which is a good thing. And I just feel we should have the openness to say, like, some people don't fit in the social norms that, that have been established now or that we fought for. And we should still sort of give them the chance to find their place. Okay. Well, the, I mean, are we so threatened yes, as women? Yes. Right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So that's a standard argument. I hear it all the time. Um, it usually comes from people who I don't know. You, you know, I I am concerned with women who have suffered male violence. Okay. So I don't think we should give their rights away, or give their safety away, or give their security away in the name of uh, lofty-sounding progressive ideals that make other people feel wonderful. But we haven't actually established that we even need to adopt these norms. Um, I'm afraid it just betrays a kind of, well, not betrays it, 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 maybe it's a pleasingly optimistic view of human nature you have there. But my worry is not about trans women. My worry is about males. Male is the causal factor. And males are responsible for like 88% of sexual violence against females. And even if you look, I'm afraid to say, if you want me to spell it out, if you look at... Um, offending rates within the prison population, um, I think in America, 50% of trans women who are in federal um, uh, incarceration have a sex uh, offense against their name. And that is much higher, actually, than the male population on average. And in Britain, it's 58%. Um, so there are plenty of red flags here to say that we should not just open our hearts. It's not, it's not about being nice. It's certainly not about where they look. In my case, it's absolutely not any kind of uncomfortableness with a man in a dress. I'm not, I'm happy, you know, I'm delighted to see men in dresses. But um, it's about safety and privacy and defending the hard-won um, spaces that you're right, feminists fought for in the 70s. <laughs> see sort of I think if most people are of your opinion but um, and I'm not you know I don't disagree much but I just feel that it's there's something restrictive 
that uh, you can often see it's almost a generational thing, not that we have a different generation, but it's often a generational thing that the feminists, the generation that knows also how, what it costs to fight for these you know, female-only mm -hmm. spaces and, all this, uh, and also to fight for a place at you know, universities and get you know, a professorship and being a board member in companies and all these kind of things and how difficult it was. But and younger women uh, who maybe have not fought that hard for this are more open to to sort of not feel threatened now by having well, this lucky, idea that lucky them. transgender <laughs> are moving. Yes, lucky them. But maybe there is a point also that uh, this restrictive look at um, these achievements, because maybe it is not necessary anymore to defend these female spaces uh, <laughs> because we are here well because yeah okay, because we okay. are here okay. because we are here and we are strong uh, well <laughs> no i mean we, but we're confusing two different things here because i don't think certainly i'm not saying that there shouldn't be a place for trans women in society i think there should be um the place is not in a woman's changing room but that's not the same thing um I also just want to say something about younger women, um, and I did, you know, we used to be them, <laughs> there are some here. Um, I think their position is obviously very complicated. Some of them have never experienced uh, male aggression, and lucky them, and they've been protected from that, and that's good, but they don't necessarily know what other women go through. Some of them have experienced male aggression. I think quite a lot of them have actually experienced male aggression. I don't think that's gone away, but, you know, their responses to it are varied and some of them are in denial and some of them, you know, don't really realise what has happened to them and can't put it all together and hardly any of them have got pregnant yet or, you know, realise that their body has different capacities, <laughs> you know, in a big way. Um, so that's all to come for them and I'm just I'm afraid I'm not the sort of progressive that kind of defers to the younger generation as a source of wisdom. I think a lot of them don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine, because I didn't know what I was talking about at that age either. And that's entirely developmentally appropriate. I defer on this. I think I really enjoy also talking to... Um, I think there's a lot of... A lot. It's very, to me, it's very interesting to see the differences also for the next generation because I think that they might have just also different needs, ideas that they come up with for the society. And I think we, it's good to listen to younger people yeah. and not only think that everything that we thought was right because that I agree. might I agree. bring us into trouble. But anyway, that's also not the issue. Why do you think it's the transgender feminist um, debate has become so heated in Britain, especially. You know, in, in America, you have a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But in Britain, it seems even more heated. And I've never really understood why this is. I mean, in, in Central Europe, there's also a debate about it, but there's relatively little sort yeah. of, you know, the friction here seems to be, maybe it will come, but it seems still not as strong like what you went through now in yeah. Britain. I think, act, I mean, it's a complicated situation, and I'm not sure I fully understand it, but some suggestions, one of them is the influence of um, Stonewall, I keep mentioning it, but you can't underestimate how, how many institutions at a national level and a local level, government organisations, the Labour Party, the Tory Party, BBC, The Guardian, Daily Telegraph, all the media organisations, all the universities, quite a lot of schools, were all... In a sense, we were pushed up against it because it was everywhere. So it kind of, it, you can't really ignore it when you're being forced into training sessions or asked what your pronouns are or constantly being reminded that this is on the agenda. So there's that. Um, there's also, I suppose, a, it's easier to organize it. I don't understand the difference between us and, and Europe, for instance, but certainly in comparison to America, it's easier to, for feminists to organize. Like, we don't have to travel huge distances. Um, there, is a, there is a strong left-wing socialist movement <laughs> with a tradition of organizing, and I'm not sure that's true in, in the Democrats mm. either. In fact, the Democrats are pushing self-ID. So 
So I can see the difference, some differences between America and the UK. Um, I mean, a lot, when I come to, I, I can see the audience here knows what I'm talking about, but I was in Italy two weeks ago and I was trying to explain all this stuff to some Italians and they were looking at me like I was crazy. You know, and I think it is, you do come up against that. Like, people just cannot believe that this is happening. And well, crazy in the sense of what yeah, you like are telling them, not that you are crazy. Well, I think they, I don't know. I mean, I'm saying, you know, there are males in women's prisons called Karen who, you know, who are raping women, female prisoners. That sounds like demented. So, um, so I always feel like we're stuck a bit between the people that think we should not talk about it at all and that we're completely heretical and evil and the people who think we're mad. Mm. <laughs> and I feel like in Europe there's still that sort of, no, this can't be happening, this is not real. You know, whereas in Britain we know it's real. Yeah. So. But if you look at the development over the last years, do you fear that, um, because you gave up your post now at university, you're now a writer, you might teach again, you're planning to teach also now at the new founded mm -hmm. uh, University of Four, I mean, it's sort of inofficially called the University of Free Speech, officially. The University of Austin. It's a University of Austin, and it's in the process of being set up now, and that's yeah. where you teach. And I'm just school. doing a bit of teaching for them. And yeah. um, But are you yeah. worried uh, that the freedom of speech in Britain, in particular now, or also in America, is threatened, yeah. that it will be impossible for yeah. people who are screamed down as transphobe or whatever other you know, um, yeah. argument is being brought forward against a, that you're not allowed to speak or that other people will not allow to speak. Is this getting stronger? Yes, it is. And that's not just about trans issues, I'm afraid. It's, a, it's partly to do with the internet, I think. Um, and it's partly to do with progressive ideals of harm and the way that the concept of harm just keeps expanding. Trauma, harm, distress, you know, it used to be that those words were reserved for very extreme situations, quantifiable situations, and now trauma can be lots of different things. So PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, more and more and more young people think they have it and are diagnosed as having it, you know, so it sort of seems to be expanding, for instance. So in that context, wherever a government tries to limit harm, it will end up cracking down on speech. And you can see that in a new bill that's coming to Parliament at the moment in Britain called the Online Safety Bill, which has quite a lot of good stuff in it about pornography and protecting children, but also has all this stuff about protecting adults from speech they don't like on the internet, basically. Um, and it's, you know, I think progressives can just think, well, you know, we're, our ideals are clearly right. It's clearly right that people should not be allowed to talk about these awful things. But um, the trans, situ trans activist situation shows how that can go wrong, because progressives, in my view, have got completely the wrong idea, and now they're imposing that on others. So, yeah. But it is, isn't it, uh, you know, I don't want to have this as a black and white debate because we see with free speech, we see what hate speech can do in mm -hmm. social media. Mm -hmm. It can destroy people. It also, you know, it can really destroy people if they're getting, and, you know, uh, partly uh, you also got sort of hit by, you well, know. I did, and that's a, how I know. A mob ganging, <laughs> a ganging. Up. Yeah, I mean, it would be very handy for me to say, yes, there should be a law <laughs> that stops that. Yeah, but that. the question is, what law? I think the question is not if we should have a law or not a law, but which type of legal framework we need for, you know, Twitter to be managed or not. I to agree. give it all, f to let it all go free, I think will not uh, really work because these media oh. organizations have become extremely powerful and we have to see yeah. how vulnerable people in that space and all of us are also protected uh, by... I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm not a free speech absolutist. I, I think there's sort of theoretical issues, like which law should be applied, and then there's practical issues about managing the internet and Twitter with millions of users. Um, I mean, at the moment, as far as I understand it, there's some poor... There's a factory somewhere of moderators just making almost arbitrary decisions, you know, loads and loads and loads and loads of feminists get banned for saying men can't be women. You know, you can get banned on Twitter for saying men can't be women. So um, it's going to be a very blunt instrument, instrument in practice. 
um, once you start saying, no, certain things cannot be said, because it will depend on the interpretations of moderators, and it's, and it's the internet where intention is always lacking, context is always lacking, people retweet things, they don't even know what they mean, you know, it's just real minefield, and I, I'm very skeptical that it will be, the, the gains you might get from having a law that tries to manage all that will be, um, I think they'll be undercut by all the losses in terms of what people can say. So I, anyway, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess and it's a long debate. At that point, I would like to uh, say goodbye to our uh, viewers on the internet because this talk will be viewable. We had a lot of people signing up also for the talk, thinking it was online okay. and, um, and it's actually in person, but it will be put on our YouTube channel. And in that sense, I would like to say goodbye and thank you very much for listening to our talk tonight. Thank you. <laughs>